we ended class last time was with the, prefer which was with the proverbial $64,000 question. How does a state evolve, grow, transition, pick your active verb, from either competitive oligarchies, which we regarded as states with high degrees of contestation, but low degrees of participation, or inclusive hegemonies, which is the exact opposite, high degrees of participation, but low degrees of contestation, into full-fledged polyarchies. Okay. How does the state become more democratic? How does the state develop the necessary institutions to demonstrate that it is not just democracy as structure, but also democracy as practice? Okay. Democracy as structure is simply the institutions, the stuff that you know looks nice on the Constitution. Democracy as practice is basically what we have been doing for the past week and a few days under our new presidents. Okay? Democracy is structure, periodic elections every four years. Democracy is practice, we suddenly turn airport terminals into public spheres of civic disobedience. <laughs> okay? That's one way of looking at it. So the $64,000 question is how do we get more democratic? Looking at Dahl's two parts or two axiom charts, we either Note that states can develop inclusive um, participation with high levels of contestation, or this doesn't happen all that often. Usually, when it does, a world war happens. High degrees of participate, high degrees of participation now start including the degrees of pluralism. The big question is what takes place here? And what takes place in the middle? Because this entire field is basically where we can plot every single country, depending upon their degree of participation and contestation. So with that in mind, what takes place here? There is more than just participation and contestation. There is more than just simply structural configurations. But it does lead one to conclude, OK, there are certain things that need to be in place. And what are they? Well, as far as this class is concerned, there are five arenas that Libs and Stepan regard as necessary to be present in order for the country to be a liberal consolidated democracy. Now for those of you that did the reading, you don't want to take a guess, you want to take a shot, what are at least one of the five components that go into a liberal consolidated state? If you did the reading, it's as plain as day. Start with, let's just do one for the time being. What do you think? Free and lively civil society. OK, very good. <laughs> Give me another one. A what? A valued political system. So we've got civil society. We've got political society. We also got two people that are giving the answers with laptops open, so which is totally fine. If you're, still, if you're looking at your readings, it's better. Okay. So we have a civil society. Oops. Uh -oh. Look at that. <coughs> okay, never mind. <laughs> we have a civil society. I thought it was going to animate one by one. We have a civil society. We have a political society. The rule of law. A state bureaucracy. And an institutionalized economic society. Which, of course, if you're going to argue an economic society for a democracy, what's the best kind of economic society? Capitalism, market capitalism. So the bulk of our class today, we're going to go through these five points one by one. And I'm going to then argue that we need to add these five components to Dahl's participation contestation graph to then really decide where countries lie on that map. So let's start with civil society. Now civil society, the last couple of years, has been somewhat difficult to explain to students. If you've been paying attention to what's been happening in this country for the past week and a few days, you kind of have heard about civil society. Maybe you have even participated in civil society. But civil society, and this is something that I talk about in greater detail in my politics and culture class, is the arena of the state where self-organizing groups, movements, and individuals 
function independently of the state and articulate values and to and I gotta get that hand out, I go, sorry, and forge group solidarities. <laughs> The arena of the state where self-organizing groups, movements, and individuals function independently of the state and articulate values and forge group solidarities. Civil society is basically all of you. If you are not part of the government and your job does not involve you working for the state, you are civil society. Civil society can be protest movements, but more importantly, they can be political action groups, civic action groups to be more specific. They can be NGOs, they can be charity groups, they can be philanthropy groups, PTAs, Boy Scouts, workers unions, you name it. A civil society is one that usually is seen when the government does something bad and then people kind of voice their grievances against it. Sometimes civil society gets their act together a little bit sooner and tells everybody on their Facebook page to call your local senator or your local congress rep to do something, right? But even there, Civil society is still only partially defined because what civil society is ultimately viewed as is not so much a reactionary citizenry, but here, and this is the word that we use, an empowered citizenry, an empowered citizenry. Civil society, in so many words, is a measurement of how much of a damn people give about the community that they live in. How often are you willing to volunteer your time to either be present in the public sphere, to take part in a rally, to knock on doors with clipboards, to do surveys, to organize sit-ins, to you know, handle mail, you know, mail orders, to do things to constantly remind your elected officials that they are there for you, right? So civil society has two critical functions. Number one, <clears throat> They are critical for government transparency and evaluation. They are absolutely necessary as a way of showing public support or displeasure in their elected officials. So the Women's March on Washington a weekend ago is an example of civil society. The near spontaneous protests that took place at airports over the past couple of days is an example of civil society. The fact that, and this is my personal favorite, the National Park Service in this country has now gone rogue. <laughs> now you gotta think about this for a minute. And again, you know, in a hundred years or so, when Ken Trails finally give cats opposable thumbs to which they can rise up and, you know, take over the planet and enslave humans. Another hundred years after that, historians are going to look back on this time period and note that Trump's presidency is either going to be the most powerful presidency in American history or the weakest. One of the two, there's nothing in between. Because in a matter of a week and a few days, Trump, love him, hate him, has managed to do more for civil society than any president in recent memory before him. Leave it to Trump to turn the National Park Service rogue and buck the system, and leave it up to Trump to turn airport terminals into realms of the public sphere. That's your example of civil society. For good or for ill, civil society checks the authority of the states. And what it ultimately shows is an active, educated, engaged, and empowered citizenry. Let me repeat that again. An active, educated, engaged, and most importantly, empowered citizenry. <clears throat> Active, educated, engaged, empowered. Weak civil societies are those that don't care. Weak civil societies are those that at best show up to vote once every four years. Active civil societies are those that give a damn. Now, the thing to understand is that civil society is directly related to its next counterpart, 
political society. That's the second thing. Political society is really the opposite side. It is the government. It's the political parties. And some would argue, although this is somewhat ambiguous, your lobbying groups. Nobody really wants them in either of their camps, but you know, civil society puts them in political, and political puts them in civil. But political society is defined by Lewis and Stefan, the arena of the state that is organized around exercising public, in this case, more specifically elected, power of the state apparatus. And this is pretty self-evident. I mean, this is there's really nothing surprising about this. Political society is, you know, your political parts. It's your government. Right? They're responsible for directing state government as well as state power. No big deal. Civil society elects political society. Political society at least represents the will and the interests of civil society. So there's your republic right there in that regard. Right? Political society represents civil society in state organs. And so in a democracy, we really want to see civil and political society acting in equilibrium. They should be congruent. Right? If civil society and political society work great, civil society is active, political looks at this and you know, acts upon that, you've got yourself a democracy. So that's just the, that's like the social quality. Like that's your democracy as practice right there. But we still have a lot more to do. And probably the most important one out of all five, at least in terms of institutions, function, and structure, and again, none of this stuff should be that shocking to you, is the rule of law. Duh. The rule of law is more than just simply constitutional law. Because every state has a constitution. Not every state actually follows that constitution. When we talk about the rule of law, we also have to take into account the routinization of law. In a democracy, you know, you may have heard about this, or it may, you know, you may have heard this, right? Justice is blind. Well, in this case, it's more truth than cliche. Because the rule of law in a democratic state is both objective and impartial. The rule of law functions as an intermediary between civil and political societies. Civil society expects political society to operate within the rule of law. Political society also knows that civil society is going to defend and uphold the rule of law. So when political society does something outside the rule of law, well, we all rush to Newark Airport with signs. The other thing to know about the rule of law is that they are universal. They are objective. So the law does not apply to one group of people and then suddenly is altered for another. Okay, what's that? Theoretical. Theoretical. Remember, we're all talking about theory here. But let's, be, you know, but let's be honest. Here's a very simple example of a rule of law. What happens if you run a red light and, and, and more importantly, a cop sees you? Okay, what do you get? What happens? Cop pulls you over, right? Now, the cop's not there, you know, the cop didn't see it, I didn't do it. I'm sure many of you follow that rule. <laughs> <clears throat> but a cop pulls you over, he says you ran a red light, and you know you ran that red light. You're like, okay, what am I doing? Right? Now, he might let you off with a warning, and in that case, you're like in his debt for like the next five seconds or whatever it is. But he has every right to issue you a ticket. If the cop pulls you over for speeding, okay, and I'm not even going to say how ridiculously you know you were pulled over, like you were caught doing 60 in a 55. I was like, okay, seriously? And if you're caught doing 110 in a 55, okay, it's another thing, right? But the cop has every right to give you a ticket, right? Now you may not be happy about that, but the cop is operating within the rule of law. You, as a citizen, have a right of contesting that ticket. Okay? That is also within the rule of law. Now it's really up to the judge to decide whether to throw the book at you or to let you go. 
but we expect the judge to also be impartial. The judge is not going to throw the book at one person because they just didn't like the way that they looked or the skin color they had or the religious garb that they were wearing, and then the other one will just say, well, boys will be boys. Get out of here. You know? So no, 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 we don't want that. Okay, that we don't want. That's a violation of the rule of law. The rule of law is everybody is subjected to the same laws. We may not like the laws. We may not agree with the laws, but they are the laws, and we have to follow them. So the rule of law is probably the least normative out of all five. The rule of law is, in this country, red means what at a light? Stop. Green means, and the most ambiguous one, yellow means. Go faster. All right, for those of you, all right, let's just, let's, because I love to do this every year. How many of you abide by the law of yellow light means go really fast? All right, and how many of you are those people that when the light turns yellow, you slam on the brakes? Do us all a favor. Be in the right-hand lane when you do that. It's an unwritten law on the highway. If you're in the right-hand lane, we expect you to drive slow. We expect you to be like you're from Pennsylvania. <laughs> if you're in the left-hand lane, it's kind of implied that you've got some place to go. And if you are from Pennsylvania, move over! Because <laughs> they never do. Right? That's the more ambiguous one. Okay? Now, you know, the cop pulls you over for running a red light. You can kind of be like, the light was yellow. The cop pulls you over and you know that you ran a red light. You have no defense. Okay? You have no defense, right? That's, that's it. Okay. okay. So, so far, we've got civil society, political society, rule of law. Real easy stuff. Now we get to my favorite. You think, really? Ross, in your back, excited about a bureaucracy? Oh, check out this one. Bureaucracy is a really weird one. Yes, go ahead. Wait a minute. Where would you uh, place, like, military or police uh, on, like, between those three? Like, whether or not they're uh, a part of the civil society, political society, or the rule of law? They would be, the military and the police actually would fit here, state bureaucracy. And I'll tell you why, just as I'm about to explain this. State bureaucracy is weird, but a state bureaucracy is, if rule of law is the most important state bureaucracy, is probably number two. And why is that? A state bureaucracy are all of those services and functions and people who do things behind the scenes. They're the people, the organizations, the groups that get you from point A to point B. Okay? State bureaucracy handles all of the routine, day-to-day -day activities of the states. They collect revenue from taxation. They allocate revenue from taxation. They implement elements of the law. So they function as the security apparatus, whether it happens to be law enforcement at the local level or state enforcement at the military level. The bureaucracy is understood as that organization with the capacity to command, regulate, and extract. They are, for all intents and purposes, the functioning institutions, better yet, the functioning processes behind the scenes. You're not exactly sure who they are. You're not exactly sure how they work. But they get the job done from sunup to sunset. The way that I like to allegorize this is how many of you are using um, windows? How many of you are using uh, PCs, not Macs, but PCs? OK. Now, for those of you, I'm sure everybody knows about this. Okay? You're using a PC. You all know that when in doubt, if your computer is screwing up, when in doubt, we have this wonderful thing called the three key salutes. Control, alternate, delete. Now, in this day and age, the three key salute opens up this beautiful little window. And for those of you who want to do this, just go ahead and follow me along with this. Right? Do three keys, do three key punch. I promise I will not reset the computer. OK, do three key punch. And there's going to be a tab on that window that says processes. Okay. You click on that tab, and there's a whole bunch of things that are operating behind the scenes. You have no idea really what half of them are. And you have even less of an idea of where they're located or what they do. But you know that all of them have to be working. Otherwise, you get blue screen of death. Mm -hmm. 
And you know, for all of you who use PCs over the years, if something's wrong with the PC, there's going to be a little window that opens up that in so many words says, computer is not going to work, F you. <laughs> Why? I'm not even going to tell you. Something's wrong. A key registry has performed any legal function. I have no idea what the hell that means. This program has performed any illegal function and must be shut down. And it shuts down your computer. You have no idea what that means. You have no idea what an illegal versus legal function is. But the bureaucracy, the processes of your computer are basically ruining your day. That's the bureaucracy. The bureaucracy are the people who work behind the scenes. You don't really see them. You don't really know what they do. You oftentimes question why they get the paycheck that they do. Sometimes they don't even know what they do. But if you have ever tried to argue with somebody at any of Rutgers Administrative Services building for something, and they just come back at you with forms and regulations and things where you're just kind of like, okay, just leave me alone, that's bureaucracy. If you have ever been exposed, and this is another thing that you need to experience before you graduate, the ever so famous and culturally important, are you screwed moments. You know what that is? That's bureaucracy doing its thing. You don't know why, you don't know how, you don't know when, you don't know where, you don't even know what. But you know that your day is ruined. That's bureaucracy for you. Bureaucracy in this case handles at absolute least taxation and public spending. Right? Bureaucracy decides every April 15th you send in a check to the federal government. And they're the ones that decide where to allocate that money. Now, that in of itself gives it inordinate degrees of power. Here's the other thing that makes the bureaucracy both annoying and fascinating at the same time. Just like those processes on your computer, who, which you have no control over and you don't know how to repair, the bureaucracy is the one element of a democratic system that is non-democratic. Let me repeat that. The bureaucracy is the one element of a democratic system that is at least functionally non-democratic. You do not vote for them. They are not held accountable by civil society. There is little transparency between the bureaucracy and the public sphere. Whenever an elected official makes a proclamation, this law has been passed, this shopping mall has been opened, this forest has been preserved, and they show up with the novelty scissors and cut the novelty ribbon or whatever it is, that's the end result. The elected officials did little to nothing. The people who got you where you were, that's the bureaucracy. The political society creates the bureaucracy to remain apart from public scrutiny because at some point, Debate is over, and we just need to get things done. Okay? So once the bureaucracy has been given a work order, their job is to put that work order into use. Okay? That's the point. Number five, an economic society. Right? An economic society. Now, an economic society is really a nice way of saying market economy, more specifically, capitalism. And this is also relatively self-evident. A market economy, like the principles of modernization theory, right? So our good friend Seymour Lipset, still, still kicking. Well, actually, I think he's, he was actually dead. His theory is kicking. He, he himself is dead. Um, but Lipset's hypothesis about the importance of a market economy is, is itself critical. Because a market economy denotes the presence of a middle class. It denotes the presence of an economic society that has the freedoms to engage in capital entrepreneurialism, competition, and innovation. So it's not that Adam Smith gets you democracy, but it's the conditions of Adam Smith facilitate democracy. The conditions of Adam Smith are kind of side effects to democracy. Or some would even go so far as to argue that democracy is a side effect of Adam Smith. So the presence of a middle class denotes a number of existing freedoms 
liberties, and rights. So it stands to reason that an open, competitive market economy facilitates competition, entrepreneurialism, and innovation. That can only exist, healthy in, exist, in a democracy. So all five criteria are important. All five are interlinked and are interdependent within this systemic model of democracy. If you have all five, chances are you're doing good. If you've got really four out of the five working, you might be able to get by, but you've still got some work to do. If you have three out of the five, we're already talking a hybrid regime. And if you have only two of the five, you've still got a ways to go. So in order to explain why some countries are more democratic than others, Linz and Stefan help us look more specifically at five different criteria. So therefore, it is worth asking again, when is democracy consolidated? When do we go from democratizing to a democracy? Right? When can we say, all right, we're good? That doesn't mean that we just kind of kick up our feet, light up, and you know, enjoy ourselves. Not yet. But we've done a lot of work so far. But one thing that I kind of like about Linz and Stefan is that they are very structural when it comes to the five points. They tend to get rather metaphysical when they explain the conditions of democracy. Democracy is consolidated when behaviorally, attitudinally, and constitutionally, democracy is, or better yet, democracy, when democracy is behaviorally, attitudinally, and constitutionally embedded. And when any alternative political structure than democracy is small enough to pose no threat to the democratic system. In short, a country has finally reached democratic consolidation when democracy, the idea of democracy, is what they call the only game in town. The only game in town. What does that mean? It means that no matter how bad the system may get at times, you can go to bed knowing that tomorrow morning you will wake up and the country will still be democratic. You know, when we go to the polls and vote for president, you do know that even though we are living in a two-party system, you do know that there are other political parties out there, right? You do know that there is more than just column A and column B, right? Okay? And some of these political parties, okay, you've got the Green Party, which is, you know, okay, you know, whatever. You have, you know, maybe an independent here or two. But have you ever seen some of the other, like, really wacky, kooky political parties that are out there? Vermin Supreme is his own political movement. That's, that's definitely the case. Do we have extremist political movements in this country? Yes. yes right? Do we have anti-establishment movements in this country? Yes. yes. What's the likelihood? What is the likelihood of any of these political parties or movements ever coming to power in this country. And don't be snarky with Trump. Very little, okay? Statistically insignificant, okay? Now, this is one thing that makes democracy, in many ways, self-insulating. We know that they're out there, okay? The KKK is out there, okay? The American Nazi Party is out there. What's the likelihood of any of these movements getting elected? Hardly any. Right? We can actually allow them to exist. Better yet, we'll even give them a website. And sometimes, if we have nothing else better to do, we'll give them airtime. Because you know what? Are they really ever going to show that they're anything other than crazy kooky? Of course not. As a matter of fact, if you really want, those of you who are fearing for where this country is going today, take it from somebody who provides a little bit of soothing optimism. Yeah, it's kind of weird and it's kind of unsettling that Steve Bannon is kind of like the spokesperson for the current government. But you know what I have to say about this country? You know what we do? You know what democracies do to kooks like them that no authoritarian state could ever possibly do? You know what we do to them? We give them airtime to make asses of themselves. Okay? That's the thing about a democracy. A democracy is consolidated when we're like, you know what, I don't even have to worry about you people because 
you're not going to really do anything. And when you do march, or better yet, when you do, when we put a microphone under your mouth, what you say is so unbelievably stupid that you become more, you, you're comic relief. You're not a threat to the country. You come across as that crazy old guy that yells at traffic in front of the local post office. <laughs> so when we talk about democracy in this way, democracy is therefore the only game in town. Now, this is when, more than 10 years ago, I had a student raise his hand and then ask what quite possibly was one of the most thought-provoking questions that I ever had. And the student asked, does that then mean, does that therefore mean that democracy is hegemonic? And it was like dead silence from me for about like 45 seconds. And I'm like, oh my god, tree falls in the forest, no, no one's around doesn't make a sound. <laughs> is democracy hegemonic? And I turned and I turned to the student and I said, in many ways, yes. Democracy is hegemonic. Why is that so provocative? Because oftentimes, when we think of the word hegemony, when we think of something that's hegemonic, we tend to think that it is oppressive or dominating. Okay? There is no room for alternative thoughts. But that's exactly what I just said. When a democracy is consolidated, there is no logical, rational alternative to democracy. No matter how bad it is, you know what you do in a democracy when you don't like the people that are in power? What do you do? You vote them out. That's it. Democracy is self-correcting. That's the beauty of it. I'm not talking about democracy with such glowing terms because it's like freedom and liberty and all that other jazz. No. You know, democracies are annoying at times. Democracies can be incredibly asinine. But democracies are self-correcting. And so in that regard, when you go to the polls and vote for another party, you're not voting for another ideology. You're just voting for a different take on democracy. You can vote out all the Republicans in 2018. The Constitution is not going to change. You can go more to the right, and knowing the Democrats are not going to do a damn thing about it, that probably is going to happen. The Constitution will not change. What's the likelihood of a political movement in this country campaigning openly and says, if I'm elected to power, I will tear up the Constitution and write a new one? What's the likelihood of them ever getting elected? The Constitution in this country is considered to be the holiest text next to the Bible. No one will ever touch the Constitution. So in that regard, democracy in the United States is hegemonic. Now, hegemony is oftentimes understood as something that is, you know, kind of forced upon us from the top, you know? And I think it's kind of cute that a lot of people are reaching for their George Orwell's 1984 suddenly. Now, you're about 30 years late to the reading club. But okay, let's run with that. Big Brother, that's, you know, hegemony. Okay, fine. And forget it, it's already about 20 minutes, it's not gonna happen. Raise your hand if you're here. Okay. Less work for me to do. Here's the thing about hegemony. Hegemony is not just domination. Because in the words of Gramsci, hegemony is something that may be structured by people in power. It may be imposed from the top by elites to elicit consent from the public. But there is also an effort to generate a series of myths, narratives, <clears throat> beliefs, and ideals that define and institutionalize a particular imagery of state and society. This is a nice way, rather confusing way, of saying the following. So just listen to what I'm saying. I'm going to translate this into English. You can take an idea and impose it at the top, and that's domination. What hegemony is, is that the people at the bottom and that's all of us. Take that and accept it at face value. We just accept it as normal, as logical, as every day. Hegemony does not need to be oppressive. Let's go back to that easy example that we did earlier in class. No matter where you are in this country, or better yet, anywhere in the world, you stop at a traffic light and the light turns red, what do you do? And why do you stop? Why do you stop? Because the light is red. 
Did anybody ever explain to you why red means stop, or did you just kind of take it at face value? When the light turns green, what do you do? You go. Woe to the driver who suddenly comes to a traffic light and it's like blue, purple, and orange. I don't know what to do. Okay? We just take these things at face value. That's hegemonic. So in that regard, democracy is hegemonic because we accept that it is the only political structure in the country. Are there variations on democracy? Yes. But will we ever deviate from that? No. At least not under, at least not unless we are under severe, severe socioeconomic pressure. And at the absolute least, if you don't like the word hegemonic, democracy is certainly pervasive. Okay? Remember, people who are protesting against Trump are protesting not because they hate Trump, okay, maybe some are, but they're ultimately protesting what they see as violations of democracy, violations of the law. And this is the best part. In a hegemonic system, and just listen to me as I'm asking this, who are the active defenders of the system? We are, civil society, very good. We are, we provide the defense. Politics in this country, regardless of any country, doesn't have to be just the United States. Politics is characterized by a state-sanctioned democratic political framework. And, you know, it's wrapped up in various symbols and narratives that, you know, we may think are a little corny and cliched at times, but trust me, we're never going to abandon the meanings and the symbolism of the flag, the bold eagle, Statue of Liberty, Mount Rushmore, the Crack Liberty Bell, you know, all that jazz. That stuff is just, we just kind of you know, almost Pavlovian-like respond to as, okay, that's American. That's, that's American democracy. And if you want to get, once again, more academically vague, because academics are, if anything, clear, <clears throat> and also by a citizen-based contribution of social and political values that, in the words of Peter Bacharach and Barrett's, limit the scope of the political process to public consideration of only those issues which are comparatively innocuous to both groups. What does that mean? It effectively means that in a, in a hegemonic system, what we argue over is really semantics. We argue over semantics. We are not arguing over systemic things. And when we actually get to the point where we argue over systemic things, it's seen as a deviation, an aberration of the norm. Now, in a normal electoral system, we have Democrats and Republicans, which are basically talking about, we need more money for public education. No, we need more money for private education. OK, you know what both of them are basically saying? We need you know, money from taxation. That's it. Okay. We need more money for defense. No, we need more money for environmentalism. Okay. The minute that somebody says, repeal all environmental laws, then people start getting really upset. Okay. That's the difference. So that leads us to the final observation about democracy, and that is, if democracy is also functionally the realization of the majority, the will of the majority, does that necessarily mean that the majority is itself ideologically democratic? Are they fair? Are they upholding social justice? No. There's another difference between democracy as practice and democracy as structure. Democracy as structure is just simply making certain that the voice of the majority wins the election. That's all. But democracy as practice asks, what is the voice? Democracy as structure says, freedom of speech. Democracy as practice asks, what are they reading? Democracy as structure says, comparative advantage is given to seasoned politicians. Democracy as practice asks for a large trust fund. The other thing to take into account, and I'm sure that at this stage of the game, we are all both numb and used to American political culture now, after a year and a half of campaigning for president, and you all thought that it was going to be nice and calm after November. <laughs> Silly Americans. <Okay? laughs> I 
point you to Tocqueville because Tocqueville notes the dangers of the majority. Now, Tocqueville is fascinated with the use of town hall meetings in early 19th century America. He thinks that this is a radical departure from the elitism and the aristocracy that characterized France. But Tocqueville also notes that the town hall meetings, the local town councils, the referendum, the committees, they can all still institutionally uphold, defend, and enforce undemocratic ideas. Got to remember, the law backed slavery in this country until the mid to late 19th century. The law backed apartheid. And those that spoke out against it oftentimes feared for their physical life and limb. And that's why I think it's worth pointing out one final thing in Tocqueville. And I especially want you, if you have it, to look at pages 298 to 299. If you don't have it, just make a note in your notes. Because Tocqueville shows us once again what hegemony in a democratic system can do. In a non-democratic system, the heretic, the rebel, the dissenter, what usually happens in an authoritarian system for someone or a group that stands out against the norms of the state, what happens? You can get arrested, that's pretty much the most benign thing, but what else could happen to you? You could get executed, what else could you do? Tortured, okay. One final thing. Let's say that we're not gonna execute you and we're not gonna torture you, but you are arrested. You just, you're sort of incarcerated for years and years. You become like a Nelson Mandela, okay? Now in an authoritarian state, it is almost necessary for these types of corporeal punishments to happen. But what ends up happening in some of these things is that, isn't it also true? that the person who gets arrested or punished or executed turns into a martyr afterwards, you know? Like, did you, did, was Nelson Mandela's incarceration the end of Nelson Mandela? No, of course not. As a matter of fact, whenever I think of Nelson Mandela in prison, I think of Morgan Freeman narrating his time in prison. Okay, as a matter of fact, Morgan Freeman played Nelson Mandela at one point, which shows you how awesome that is. Okay, many of you saw that kind of gets the point across. You can execute somebody and guess what? Martyrdom, a rallying cry. What does a democracy do that is 10 times worse than any of this stuff? Irrelevancy. A democracy will make you irrelevant. A democracy will take away your voice, take away your credibility, won't necessarily torture you, won't incarcerate you because that gives you too much attention. At the absolute best, a democracy, when they're done with you, you'll be lucky if you can get a spot on Dancing with the Stars. Okay? You might, might be lucky enough to also get a spot on Celebrity Apprentice or Celebrity Survivor or whatever. Maybe VH1 will do a Where Are They Now thing. Okay? But other than that, you're done. Politicians, civic leaders, anyone, anyone. So I feel like I just want to read this. This is from this is from Tocqueville. This is from Tocqueville. This is page 298, 299. This is probably one of the most hardcore things that you'll hear. In America, the majority has staked out a formidable fence around the thought. Inside those limits, a writer is free. But woe betide him if he dares to stray beyond them. Not that he need to fear an autonomy, whatever that is, but he is the victim of all kinds of unpleasantness and everyday persecutions. A political career is closed to him, for he has offended the only power with the capacity to give him an opening. He is denied everything, including renown. Before publishing his views, he thought he had supporters. It seems he has lost them once he has declared himself publicly. For his detractors speak out loudly, and those who think as he does, but without his courage, keep silent and slink away. He gives in and finally bends beneath the effort of each passing day, withdrawing into silence, 
as if he felt ashamed at having spoken the truth. Formerly, tyranny employed chains and executioners as its crude weapons. But nowadays, civilization has developed despotism itself, even though it appeared to have nothing else to learn. Princes had, so to speak, turned violence into a physical thing. But our democratic republics have made it into something as intellectual as the human will it intends to restrict. Under the absolute government of one man, despotism, in order to attack the spirit, crudely struck the body, and the spirit escaped free of its blows, rising gloriously above. But in democratic republics, tyranny does not behave in that manner. It leaves the body alone and goes straight to the spirit. No longer does the master say, you will think as I do or you will die. He says, you are free not to think like me. Your life, property, everything will be untouched. But from today, you are a pariah among us. You will retain your civic privileges. They will be useless to you. For if you seek the votes of your fellow citizens, they will not grant you them. And if you simply seek their esteem, they will pretend to refuse you that too. You will retain your place among men, but you will lose the rights of mankind. When you approach your fellows, they will shun you like an impure creature. And those who believe in your innocence will be the very people to abandon you, lest they be shunned in their turn. Go in peace. I grant you your life, but it is a life worse than death. That's pretty hardcore. Right? That's pretty hardcore. What does a democracy do for those who exist outside the hegemonic frame of thought? Irrelevancy. And there have been a lot of people in this country and others whose ideas may have been revolutionary, may have been visionary, but they came too early, too premature, and as such, they have been forgotten. And at the risk of revealing my own cards, although you probably have put two and two together and figured this one out. Prior to two years ago, Bernie Sanders was a nobody. Bernie Sanders has been saying the same thing for the past 30 to 35 years. Go back to the early 1980s on like, you know, grainy video recordings of C-SPAN. He'll be saying the same things, and I guarantee you, nobody took him seriously, at least in Washington. Especially in the Reagan era, anybody talking about democratic socialism, it's amazing he wasn't arrested. The only thing that made Bernie Sanders today relevant is the socioeconomic condition that we find ourselves in. But in times of prosperity, in times of development, Bernie would be little more than a curiosity. Before there was Bernie, there was Dennis Kucinich. Before Dennis Kucinich, you may have even heard of this other guy, Ross Perot. You might remember Ross Perot. You guys probably were too young to remember him, but just YouTube Ross Perot. He became a big hit for about six to eight months, and then suddenly fades off into oblivion. Those who think outside the political box, they can be radicals for good, they can be radicals for evil, to use normative terms, but the system turns them into comic relief. And they can say all the right things no one will pay attention to them. So one of the dangers of democracy, again, I want to go back to this. Are there limits in democracies? Are there limits to what we think? Are there limits to what we can do? Yes, absolutely. You can't just do, every, you can't just do whatever you want in a democracy because that's chaos. But at the same time, are there certain social limits that we place on democracy that do perhaps prevent us from thinking more progressively. And when I say progressive, I'm not talking about left wing, right wing. I'm just thinking, I'm just simply thinking differently, thinking outside the box. Okay? So when we talk about democracy, we talk about a certain degree of political rights and civil liberties, that much is certain. And we like to think that there are a certain degree of freedom within those political rights and civil liberties, but there's only so far that we can go and certain ideas are still seen as far too radical. Again, it's a normative answer, but it's something to leave us with. It's never happened before. That couldn't possibly work. Okay? And you'd be surprised how much normative answers keep us within a limited playing field of democracy. And that is 
something to think about. That's really where I want to go starting next.